<laughs> like one of those dog, what are those? Uh... Just give me the beat, give me the beat first. <laughs> so anyway, uh, this is work that is has been published in Organizational Research Methods. It's a series of papers. It was supposed to be three, um, but two out of three isn't bad, I guess. And um, that's kind of the rate anyway, I guess. So <laughs> um, this is uh, some thinking that's described in this first paper. And this notion of a general cross lag model, all, all we're, uh, we really mean by that is um, just a kind of a VAR or vector autoregressive model, right? So lagged associations um, in the model like everyone has been talking about so far. Um, it's a discrete time model. So um, it's kind of a mapping of the past onto the future as opposed to kind of a continuous flow, which is um, what Man Manuel talked about. And then um, it can be reparameterized re for that purpose. So if you wanna to go to the next slide, uh, <clears throat> what's, what's the point of this and what are we often doing in the social sciences uh, in kind of obs observational research? And certainly in some fields like um, economics where historically they haven't had recourse to experimentation um, what do they do and what are they after? Well, we all know that uh, this, this is famous dictum uh, phrased by Berkeley here quite well in 1710, and that is that correlation does not necessarily imply causation. Well, this is an issue to the extent that we work with what we often call correlational data or observational data, but really kind of what we mean by that is data that come from a research design that doesn't involve an explicit intervention um, right, so there's no action carried out, nothing is done, um, and uh, at least kind of actively by the researcher in order to change any of the variables, and certainly nothing like random assignment, for example, to experimental conditions, which is usually a prerequisite for making causal inferences, right, so that's the entire, uh, uh, in fact, where RCTs get their name, so, um, so what do we do if we have experimental, uh, non-experimental data? Um, and, and these days, of course, we have quite a lot of it. We're awash in it. So what are we going to do with these data uh, in order to make causal inferences? Also, if you want to go ahead to the next, <laughs> to the next slide. Um, so from data to causes, if we have data, how do we get to causes or causal inference? Um, and what a lot of researchers have been using for a long time in psychology and elsewhere Again, in uh, microeconomics, they've been using uh, data that they refer to as panel data. And really by panel data, what they mean is they just mean data collected for some number more than one of N units. So quite often in psychology, you're working with people. So some number of people at some number of occasions T. So collected over time um, in sequence, for example, some number of 100 or more or whatever people and typically um, fewer than 15 occasions, or at least historically, that's been true. And so the kinds of models um, that fall under this moniker cross lag model, uh, a cross lag model, work with data like this, and usually many fewer than 15 occasions. Um, but obviously, in more modern research designs, you see a lot of uh, data collection at um, sometimes high frequencies, um, like heart rate, things like that. So biometric data. And so they have many occasions of measurement there, um, quite often few, many fewer people than 100, um, but also uh, in ecological momentary assessment designs or ESM experience sampling method designs or diary studies or whatever, where they're collecting, uh, where they have many occasions of measurement. And in those cases, you can use um, alternatives that are approximately the same or quite similar at least. And so one example of that is this dynamic structural equation model. Uh, framework in M plus, you can read about that, or um, other people have alternative multi-level analogs of, of what I'll be talking about here, including Manuel, your work on um, continuous time analysis or continuous time models in a multi-level framework. You can go check that out. Uh, anyway, the point of working with these data is that they allow us to control for some confounds, which is the whole point of randomization in um, experimental designs and model the effects of the past on the future, which in theory is kind of what causality is all about. Causality by definition is something that occurs over time, even if it's almost instantaneous. Um, 
typically we're thinking about, right? We're not working kind of quantum mechanically. We're not thinking about entanglement and spooky action at a distance. We're thinking about um, effects that occur over time and can be mechanistically conceived. Um, and the third thing, I, I like how your cursor is also following the order. That's really good. That's, is that intentional or is that just subconscious? <laughs> the, uh, I'm very focused. <laughs> That's right. It's good. I, I would get lost otherwise. And then so, and the third thing is um, because we're going to treat all observed variables as dependent variables or endogenous, um, we are going to be able to overcome some of the assumptions that we have about the direction of effects that are typically found in um, particularly cross-sectional designs where you have to more or less make a choice. There's not enough information in the data to estimate reciprocal relationships typically. Um, so that's that's what we're going to try to do with these data. So if you want to go ahead. Um, so what are the kinds of things we want to control? Um, well, <clears throat> what this shows if you, if Zoom works is um, uh, how we might conceptualize one kind of a potential confound that we want to control for, we call that an occasion effect. And that's essentially what that is, is that it's um, kind of a shared correlation among all units or, or everybody in a sample. So for example, what this is, is it shows, uh, it shows kind of subjective well-being or something, affect evolving over time. And, um, and then at some point, the trajectory goes down uh, sharply, precipitously, and the idea is, you know, people who were there in what seems like a lifetime ago in uh, 2015 in, in New York in that tower, um, when they all realized that actually Hillary lost and Trump is going to be the next president, president of the United States. And that's a shared effect that happens to everyone. So because we're not differentiating people, everybody experiences the same thing. Um, it's going to be hard to make causal inferences that involve change. Um, within individuals over time, just based on the information that exists in a sample. So things like the global financial crisis to the extent that, that was shared or common weather or whatever. Uh, if you're teaching in a class or something, you know, so like everybody here kind of experienced the um, technical difficulties, although I think it impacted some people more than others uh, st still. Um, and really what this is conveniently in an SEM framework is uh, we're working multivariately um, is this is just a mean, an estimated mean or an intercept, which is provided by default for each observed variable. So that's kind of, you get something for nothing there. Um, so if you want to move on in a multi-level framework, you would have to include dummy variables or some other way of doing it. A cross-classified approach will do that, for example. Um, and another thing that we typically want to control for, so this really doesn't make any sense, does it? Um, is uh, the past along a given variable. We just want to ensure that, um, that the history associated with a given individual doesn't confound um, any of the causal inferences we might make um, when we're looking at uh, two variables that evolve over time and, uh, and may have uh, effects on each other. So, um, uh, so anyway, we include in our model an autoregressive or AR term to control for the past. Um, and essentially what that what we're trying to do there is erase any heterogeneity in the sample or differences in our sample um, across people, uh, if we're studying people that exist in the past. So um, we're just trying to remove that as a potential explanation for any uh, future uh, relationships that we observe or any uh, alternative relationships that we observe. So if you want to go to the next one without the little evolution of those lines, it's less interesting. What we also want to do is based on the idea that causality is something that occurs over time, um, anything that appears to occur, co-occur kind of simultaneously, we also want to eliminate that. And so what we call this co-movement, and really what we mean by that is, for example, two people who change together, or rather two variables that might change together, like subjective well-being and income. If you want to know if those influence each other, um, and someone is brought into a room and they're told that they're fired, that's going to immediately impact their income. And it's also going to impact their subjective state. So um, if those things move immediately together simultaneously, it would be hard to say that one causes the other, right? So an economist might say, and then it becomes this field specific 
style of inquiry if you're working only with cross-sectional data where um, um, some people from one field might say, oh, we're gonna model the effective income on subjective well-being. And um, which, is, which is surprisingly kind of more what a psychologist would do. Whereas um, an economist might say, we're gonna look at the effect of health, for example, on income. Um, because they assume quite often in health economics that those factors influence income. So income is the DV, whereas in psychology, subjective well-being is the DV. Uh, so anyway, if, if things co-occur, then you know, that might suggest a causal effect. Maybe, maybe we need more frequent measurements to tease that out or tease that uh, apart. But, um, but just to be conservative, we're going to not allow those to influence how we make our causal inferences. We're gonna to try to control for that or account for it, at least in the model. Do you wanna to go to the next one? Uh, and what should be left, the idea anyway, is what we refer to as cross-lagged associations. And really all that means is one variable's past predicts another variable's future, and it does so uniquely. It does so, and by uniquely, what I mean is the prediction uh, is unique. So we've already conditioned on the past of the variable, the outcome variable. So we're holding constant um, its own past. And therefore anything that any other variables are able to predict will be unique. Um, to those other variables in their relationship with this dependent variable. And the idea here is that by regressing uh, one variable on the past of another variable, doing prediction that way, that we get temporal priority. And because all the variables in our model are gonna be treated as outcome variables, we don't have uh, to assume any directionality. And the term here, because it's not an intervention-based form of causality, right? We've, we've already said that up front. Um, it's a different kind of predictive causality, basically. Um, unique prediction or predictability is really our criterion here for making this causal inference. We call that Granger causality after Clive Granger. Um, and so sometimes you'll see those model diagrams, but really right where the past is influencing the future. And so um, I think, Christian, you showed one of those and I'm assuming Manuel, you would have at some point too, if you showed a diagram, but I was unfortunately not there and ineffectively looking around to fix this problem. Uh, but in any case, um, what those models imply in terms of the dynamic process um, is there's a perturbation. Um, on, and this, this is not the same as what Man, Manuel was presenting. He was, or, or, or describing, he was describing um, not necessarily the underlying perturbations which occur in our models like jumps essentially, right? Because there's a stochastic input. We assume at some specific discrete time. Um, and so if, if you think about it like that, uh, what, what, what you might conceptualize as kind of a bump, we, I still draw it as continuous here. Um, and then what you get on the other variable, you would assume you, uh, is, is a causal effect. And so that one variable is passed a kind of random perturbation predicts another perturbation um, or perturbation in, in a different variable. So in this case, you might say, oh, maybe in maybe income causes subjective well-being. That's that SWB variable there. Um, but really the patterns in the data might look something like this. We still have some regression to the mean um, that we're showing here. Uh, do you want to go to the next slide, <clears throat> please? Okay, so the idea, of course, because we're not assuming directionality, is that the, pot, the effects of these different variables on each other can be positive or negative. So if an effect is positive, of course, they're just tracking each other. One goes up, the other goes up, but in the future. Um, so you essentially have this delayed, um, just this uh, pattern of delay here. Um, you're just kind of shifting one variable uh, into the future. Uh, and if you want to go to the next one, you can just kind of cycle through these relatively quickly because we're just giving something obvious, like what does a negative effect look like in terms of the level uh, levels along the variables? And so, for example, if income goes down and there's a negative effect, then obviously subjective well-being would go up and vice versa. So if you just want to keep going through that <clears throat> and then, yeah, that's it. So let's just keep going. <laughs> um, and so in the case that we have for example, because um, these associations are independently estimated, you could have one variable have a positive effect and another have a negative effect. And for some reason, psychologists kind of, and, and social, sci social scientists, social researchers get really excited about that kind of thing. 
um, uh, for, for whatever reason. Um, but if you were looking at a time series or two time series, they might look like that. So if income had a positive effect, um, or if they both positively affected each other, sorry, and then go to the next one. Um, right. And then here's the case of a positive and negative effect uh, effect mix is just, just a way to visualize the time series involved. Um, so subjective well-being goes up. So maybe that makes people, so right. So income goes up and then somebody goes out and they buy something or that generates, you know, increased self-worth or something, whatever it does, it has this temporary effect on subjective well-being. And there's some evidence for that in social psychology. Uh, and then you go to applied psychology and you go ask somebody like Jeff Vancouver, what are the effects of something like self-efficacy on productivity or, or whatever on performance? And the argument there would be that, um, that something like increased well-being, let's just say that generally it might make someone complacent because positive affects might signal that everything's fine. And so they don't feel like they are, there's no urgency to go solve any problems or whatever anyway. So it might lead to lower income. Um, but anyway, just in terms of visualizing the time series, they might look like that. So if you wanna to go to the next slide. So if we have a typical SEM um, cross lag setup, it might look something like this. And this is a kind of common diagrammatic form here. So we have uh, a series of X variables and a series of Y variables from top to bottom. And so the most recent is at the top and then we have time lags of one and then two occasions, whatever those are. Um, and <clears throat> the autoregressive terms just imply a dependence of the future on the past. Um, and so some people, uh, depending on the rest of the model, might like to think about this as um, um, having something to do with generating uh, kind of Markovian uh, setup. And the residuals here are these U terms. So the assumption is there's something left over, although obviously at the first occasion, this T minus two, that's all there is. And then... <laughs> And then we have some covariance there. Uh, oh, sorry, the cross lag terms um, move diagonally from one variable to another, and, but it's all just regression, right? So um, we're still treating, for example, y at t minus one as a control, and then estimating um, the independent effect of x at t minus one. Um, and then we have these u terms, which we'll call impulses. The idea is that those are random, um, just kind of random inputs into the system. And then the code, code movements are these double headed arrows. And the idea there is that, you know, those could be, that's the um, simultaneously occurring movement in the series. So somebody says you're fired and you feel bad and you lose your income at the same time. And can't say that one caused the other, but there's maybe a um, some kind of third variable causing both. So if you wanna to go to the next one, so we're gonna add some additional parameters though. Um, and what's kind of interesting here is that if we think about what the causal variables or agents are, um, but typically we make the causal inference based on the assumption of some kind of, if we, if, if we want to have recourse to some kind of experimental notion of random assignment, um, then one convenient way of doing that is by looking at these impulses, by looking at these um, what we will assume to be kind of random variances. Uh, we can orthogonalize these impulses as well to eliminate that covariance and then just get left over something that is totally unique to either the X or the Y series. And the idea here is that um, there's an impulse into the system in economics. They always, not always, but often conceptualize these impulses as like technology changes or something, for example, right? So they're modeling GDP or they're modeling some kind of financial, for example, time series. And whenever it goes up, that's a change in technology. Um, so whether it's a management process or something else, the term technology is kind of overly broad, I think on purpose. Uh, but the AR paths do have a role to play here, right? And, and those autoregressive paths, uh, if you just look at this and do a little bit of path tracing, you get this impulse, for example, from uh, on the x t minus one observed variable, you get an impulse from u at t minus one uh, for x. And if there's kind of a, a random assignment to a level of x there, which is what that uh, ux represents, then you can uh, trace the path 
from that and it flows forward over time through that AR term. And so that's really the persistence of the impulse. People talk about these autoregressive paths as implying persistence, but persistence of what? It's persistence of a kind of random stochastic, right, a stochastic input. Um, and because they're on the same metric, those observed variables, kind of by definition, usually one way to think about it is just the ratio of the impulse that remains. So if that, if that beta term is 0.5, it just means from time one to time two, 50% um, is left. The cross lag paths, on the other hand, uh, imply the degree of kind of unique prediction from one variable to another. But the point here is that if impulses are really random, if you believe that, then it's like mimicking random assignment to a given variable. And based on that idea, if, for example, from the series, from the X series to the Y series, we can trace the path from X's impulse, that U, X at T minus one, for example, and we can trace that path along the, uh, the, the we can trace the CL path there um, and see how we get from like a random stochastic input on X to Y. And the idea being that that might help us make some kind of causal inference uh, or, or attribute causality. Um, from uh, between the series using these CL paths. So if you want to go to the next slide, uh, <clears throat> the yeah, so that's called Granger-Sims causality. That's the idea. And that's kind of what um, in, in econometrics, they talk about Granger-Sims causality. It's a term that gets used. And usually what that means is that they're just invoking this notion, this notion of an impulse as being like random assignment because everybody loves experiments so much. They want to create some kind of analogy <laughs> between whatever they're doing and how it relates to ex an experiment. Like Christian listed all those other kind of uh, causal modeling terms like uh, uh, in, in his slide, the comparison. And on the right, those, those all get their justification by analogizing to experimentation and random assignment. Uh, so if you want to keep going here. Uh, so that's a very familiar model for anyone who's in economics and knows those AR, the VARs um, or in psych and in other areas where they do, they use those cross lag models or that DSEM model and M plus or any of those, you can do it in a multi-level modeling framework as well. Uh, but those models make some assumptions that we might want to overcome. And so that's this idea for a ge more general model. And what we mean by that is, well, well, I mean, one way to motivate this actually is what if we wanted to ensure that impulses were random? Are there any systematic sources of variation that we want to get rid of or account for that might uh, make it hard to in, infer randomness there? Uh, for example, maybe what about stable factors? So if people are systematically different from each other and stably so over time, it might be due to you know, cognitive or neurological factors, or maybe stable environments that are that separate people over time that cause stability, uh, then we might want to control for those. Because if we have something that's stable, then it's not changing over time. And then by definition, it has no role to play in a notion of causality um, that kind of unfolds over time. <clears throat> and we might also want to expand the, the kinds of dynamics that we can represent in our model. And I guess um, in Manuel's presentation, that would be kind of the functional form of those relationships uh, between those variables, those, those, um, those pretty functions that he was plotting. Um, and, and the issue here, at least in most research is that there's not actually much thought put into these, the um, structural relations between the future and the past. And so people usually just specify those AR and CL paths and move on and fits often, often acceptable because <clears throat> they'll look at something like CFI or TLI, which are always very complimentary. They're the perfect dinner party guest. They love the food, they love the wine, they love your couch. Um, <laughs> And so every, every, everybody always invites them to dinner. <laughs> um, but, uh, but we can, I think, do better and expand the range of kind of uh, dynamic relationships or functional forms that, that we might want to model here. And uh, yeah, so let's, let's move on and see what we mean by that. So that's kind of the motivation, those two things. <clears throat> 
So what about these things that we'll call unit effects, but they're called a lot of different things. They're called random effects, fixed effects. Those imply different kinds of models when people use those different terms, but really they're kind of hinting at the same thing in, in, in econometrics, they'll call it unobserved heterogeneity. And really these are just our stable factors, right? That we might want to control. Um, sometimes you refer to this as a between person component based on, um, yeah, anyway, a between person trend, something that is different between people that makes people systematically different. So personality and other traits, stable environments, for example. And so you can see that here. And so if you were to account for that, what you would essentially do is you take you would take two different series and you would uh, make them, uh, at least in the long run, the expectation would be equivalent. And so if you wanna move on to this, so it's supposed to move, but it's not gonna move. So if we go there, um, in our structural equation models, our path diagrams, we know how to represent those quite easily. We're very familiar with that. That's like day one psychometrics. Um, and so we'll show those as just factors, latent, right? latent variables, latent factors. It's not, they're not measured because by definition, um, they're not measured. We're measuring something else like income. So whatever the stable factor is or set of stable factors that produce consistency, um, in income over time, uh, we might want to model that. And so you can see that here in with, with the blue terms. And really the key here, if you want to hold those constant is to model their covariance. You need to model the association between those things. And that's kind of the difference between a random and a fixed effects model. In a random effects model, you're not modeling that covariance. And to make this a fixed effects model, you do. So you account for their relationship. Um, in order to hold them constant. And in our model, we allow for time varying uh, effects of these stable factors on the observed variables. You don't have to do that. So the alternative assumption is uh, what they often refer to as mean stability. And um, we talk in the paper about some of the issues there and how to conceptualize that and how to properly set up the model. So that's controlling for stable factors. And again, the interest there is to make the impulses more random, I guess. Right, so this something specific to the given occasion rather than something that's stable over time. And you'll see huge changes in your model parameters when you do this. Uh, and I should probably add that all of this is totally consistent with um, all this is, uh, none of this is inconsistent at least with an interest in modeling effects in continuous time. Um, you can do that using the model parameters here. You would still just focus on the AR and CL terms. And if you want to move on to the next one, thank you. Well, what about more complex dynamics? Dynamics um, that uh, that deviate from the functional forms that are allowed or implied by uh, AR and CL terms. So, for example, what if we wanted to modify the nature of persistence so that we could have a series? or uh, something that's unfolding over time, the evolution of, for example, subjective well-being, wherein someone's income increases, they sell a car or they, uh, whatever they do, maybe anyway, some, maybe it's a lottery win, right? That's kind of a classic one. So they get a lottery win and it takes some time to eat through it, hopefully, uh, but, but eat through it, they do slowly and their income slowly goes down. But what happens to their subjective well-being? Well, they feel great immediately, and so that ramps up quite quickly, uh, but maybe that drops off faster um, than the rate of decrease in income um, that, uh, that the, the, the typical cross-life model might imply. So we might wanna add something like that into our model, something that acts as a kind of damper there um, so that in the short run, we can reduce the persistence of any impulse, for example, to subjective well-being. Maybe that's shorter lived. Than, um, than income, at least in the short run. Uh, next slide, please. And so we'll do this with what we call a moving average term. This is really all we're doing is we're modeling a direct association of the past impulse on the future rather than requiring it to go through the observed variable and the AR path. Um, and really what that is, is that changes kind of the short run dynamics. You can see it as modifying the short run dynamics. Um, so to understand the persistence of an impulse, you'll add the AR and moving average terms together. I'll have to stop here pretty soon. Uh, so next slide, please. 
And if we want to diagram it, it gets quite complicated. And this is why all the flashing and everything is helpful because it shows you the arrows, but they're color coded here, um, which was actually Pete, your suggestion. So thanks for that. Um, so the MA terms are just these direct uh, effects, these parameters that um, imply dependence of the future on the past impulse directly. And so what's the next thing that we might want to do? Well, we take that same logic of basically modifying the short run and long run behavior um, of the variables in the system. And if you go to the next slide, really we're taking the same idea and we're saying, okay, well, what about if we want to modify the relationship between one series and another series um, to fit some alternative functional forms that the cross-leg model can't handle so well? Um, and we do that here with what we refer to as this is a, a stupid thing to call it. It's too long. Even the acronym is four letters. That was not smart. A cross lag moving average term, we call it. We should have just called it, somebody called it an XMA term for cross moving average, which is better. Um, but we didn't do that and now it's published. So, uh, so this is it. So what these do by linking one variable's impulse to another observed variable in the future directly, essentially what we're doing is we al um, allow for kind of an initial increase or decrease in that cross lag term. Um, so it's like you can increase the effect initially or decrease it initially and still leave the longer run behavior um, implied by the model like in the time series unchanged. So if you go to the next um, slide, you can see that there. There, I guess those are pink. Is that mag magenta or fuchsia? I don't actually know. I know about eight colors. And then anything else is like kindergarten with Crayola crowns or something. <laughs> but I think they're pink. <laughs> um, and you can see them there. So that's, <clears throat> so we actually get a lot of flexibility in the model, which is maybe also one of its downfalls to the extent that allows for a kind of overfitting or an overparameterization. But if that's your concern, then you can do. Um, you know, you can fit the model and then do some, uh, what is essentially uh, forecasting with future observations that you, that are, that you hold out, or um, you can do cross validation with the whole thing contemporaneously um, with, with some data that, 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 that you keep to the side. Okay, so that's basically what we mean by general. All it means is controlling for stable effects and kind of expanding the types of dynamics that you can um, fit using this model. Uh, and so the nice thing though, is that if those terms, those MA terms and CLMA terms aren't needed, or if those AR and CL terms aren't needed, so, so what it's supposed to do is kind of delete some and then you can see the different options here. So for example, uh, if the MA and CL CLMA terms are estimated at zero, <clears throat> then it's just like you have a typical cross lag modeling setup, right? Um, alternatively, if the AR and CL terms are estimated at zero, what does that mean? Well, that's kind of interesting. What it means is that there's an immediate effect of this impulse, but it dies out. It, it's not allowed to go two occasions into the future under this model specification, because there's no way to get from time uh, X at T minus two to X at T, so two occasions into the future, if those AR and CL paths aren't there. Um, so that's the idea, just some additional flexibility in the model. Now, again, this is both represented in discrete time as well as described in discrete time in our paper, um, but there's no reason why you can't fit a model like this and um, estimate the continuous time parameters that Manuel I was talking about. And Manuel, I think you in fact do have a couple of papers that basically show how to specify and estimate varmas and turn those into, right, um, with moving average terms, which is all we're really doing here, um, and estimate those in continuous time. So if you wanna move on to the next slide, I think I should probably stop there and just say, that's the point, that's the point. But in terms of causal inference and causality, here's the interesting thing that, that this kind of thinking motivates, and that is, and I'll just stop here, um, if we want to think about hypothesis testing and causality, there are kind of two ways to think about this. We can think about short run effects. And that's typically what people are doing when they estimate those cross lag models right there, which, which Manuel, you would have obviously touched on. And that is, they're just looking at those cross lag terms 
And there are a, right, there are a few problems with doing that. And one is that's actually kind of a short run uh, evaluation of the relationship between any two variables, right? So it's from time one to time two, whatever that time scale is, all of your inferences hinge on that. Um, and so what about longer run effects, for example, or in a continuous time framework, even in the shorter run, you can back it up until, you know, now, 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 whatever the, whatever the difference is between a gold and a silver medal, <laughs> quite depressingly, I'm sure. <laughs> um, so those short run effects, you can, you can look at those. Um, or, or scale your inferences to whatever some, you know, something that might be institutionally relevant. So in a lot of government agencies, for example, they're looking at year-on-year -year relationships and those actually matter. You know, even if effects play themselves out continuously, they're doing that. But long-run effects also become possible. And the idea there is to think about those impulses as like stochastic inputs, as if you're being randomly assigned to a level of income or something as a function of that impulse. And, uh, and in econometrics, they have a well-developed uh, set of tools for doing that. They call them impulse response, uh, impulse response functions and impulse response analysis. And there's, again, just thinking about causality, this quote by Luke Dupol, and then I'll stop, focuses on impulses as causes because changes in the variables are induced by non-zero residuals, that is by shocks. Hence to study assuming stochasticity, assuming a stochastic system. Hence to study the relations between the variables, the effects of shocks are traced through the system. So I guess because we're supposed to be talking about causality, I'll just, and way out of time, I'll stop there. And thanks for that, Christian. Sorry for all the screw ups. No worries. Thank you very much for this um, great presentation. Yeah.